Hey, welcome back. So we are uh, doing some video content for the sensory analysis class, uh, Colin 1311 in the Niagara College Culinary Innovation Program. And we're starting to dig into some of the specific techniques for sensory analysis. And this past week, we've been talking about focus groups. And something that um, often comes up is the fact that you really need to be deliberate about how you structure questions in qualitative research. Now, a focus group, as we, as we discussed, is qualitative research. We are getting opinions and beliefs and ideas and concepts. We are not getting numbers and we're not getting yes, no, um, clear cut answers that you could put into a graph or put into a pie chart or, um, turn into some form of table. Qualitative research is all about building up on ideas and beliefs and feelings about different products and concepts. And it's, it's something that is a bit more of an art form. And especially given that we've got so many students who have English as a second or second language, it's important for us to think deliberately about how we're structuring questions. But even, even for English as a first language speaker, it's really something worth reflecting on as you're building your scripts. So at the end of this video, you'll be able to define open and closed questions. You'll be able to structure the mood of the verb within a sentence to change the quality of questions and statements. And you'll utilize probing as a method to gain further insights and motivate the conversation. So why would you care about this? Well, when you're developing qualitative research, let's say you're hosting a focus group, odds are very good you're going to be developing an initial script and you'll be writing questions that are going to elicit the intended response and get the action that you are hoping for. Inevitably, you don't just go into a focus group hoping for the best. Usually you have some goals as the product development team of what you are hoping to achieve and you design those questions intentionally. And something else is worth noting is that when you're structuring those questions, you want to make sure that the mood and the tone of those, of those statements and questions are correct for the style of analysis and the style of uh, conversation that you're doing. And it's, it's, it's something that takes practice. It's something that's very deliberate. And the more you think about it intentionally, just like, just like my videos where I say I like to think about thinking, the more you think about what you're doing, the easier it's going to become. And the more you practice it, the easier it's going to come. So again, as we mentioned before, we're working on qualitative research. And in particular, we've been talking about focus groups. And these are very conversational. And in many cases, you'll have a script and you'll have set questions that you'd like to ask the group. But the nice thing about a focus group is that it has this opportunity to become semi-structured, that if, if you see that opportunity to go off of script and ask additional questions, a focus group is a great opportunity for that. And that's what we call a semi-structured interview. And that allows the participants to speak freely about their own opinions and viewpoints. And when you see it's appropriate, you can encourage them to continue speaking about those ideas so that you can gain even more insight about your product or your concept that you're working on. Now, something else that we're seeing more, and another reason why you need to be super uh, conscientious about how you're structuring a script, is that we're seeing more and more online surveys. And again, it's easy to just rattle off questions in a survey format, but you have to think very deliberately about those questions to make sure you're eliciting the outcome that you're hoping for or gaining insight that will help you find uh, new opportunities and that you're not somehow um, influencing the outcome by biases or by uh, using uh, language that isn't quite the right tone. I'm sure you've all gotten that email before where you've read it and you're like, is this person mad at me or is this person happy? Uh, oftentimes in the written word, as you are going to see in written surveys on online survey tools and so on, um, that written word needs to be extremely deliberate as well. And 
something I often suggest to students is having uh, having someone proofread it from within your team such that you can make sure that the tone and the, the style of your questions is indeed going to elicit what you're after. Now, when we were in class, I brought some Halloween candy. I realized it's it's COVID and we went with Halloween candy in our sensory analysis room. Everyone's sitting in a in a plastic cubicle. I should take a photo just for memory's sake, but uh, everyone's sitting in a plastic in a plastic box. <laughs> and it's quite fun. So we had some Halloween candy inside of our plastic boxes and we used it as our example uh, of a of a focus group. And we talked about closed questions. These are questions that really only have a limited number of answers. So I gave some examples. Do you like this candy? And really, there's only yes or no. You could you could argue maybe or it depends could be one of those answers. But really, yes or no questions are the prime example of closed questions. How, how many pieces of candy would you eat in one sitting? There you have a numerical range. And in theory, you could have infinite answers. People could eat a million pieces of candy or a billion pieces of candy. But there's a logical range that's going to occur. There's, there, it's unlikely they're going to eat more than 50. And it's unlikely they're going to eat more than a, than a small number of pieces of candy. Which candy do you prefer? Well, we've got four choices and perhaps none of the above could be a fifth choice. But you can see how these questions become limiting when it comes to extending the conversation. And in qualitative research, sometimes use of closed questions can be useful for either opening up a conversation and getting people to respond it can also be a way to wrap up certain sections of conversation and close off that conversation. It's, it's really a useful technique to use closed questions when you need to rapidly assess the group. And it's also, it's also a very non-threatening way to use closed questions. It's a non-threatening way to get people who perhaps haven't contributed much to respond and open, open up a little bit. And then if, if they're responding and you can see in their body language that they're okay, then you can probe further. Is peanut free important to you in your purchasing? Yes or no. And if they respond yes, explain to me why. I just asked a probing question. And maybe they say, well, I have small children and I need peanut free snacks to put in their school lunches or into their um, into snack bags when their kids are out at activities. Or maybe they say, well, I have a peanut allergy. You can probe oftentimes starting with a closed question, but then open it wide up with a probing aspect. So those are closed questions. Let's jump into some open questions. This is where, again, you're structuring the words in a way that encourages conversations. Tell me about your first memory of eating a Kit Kat bar. And that was a fun question in class because some students said, well, they remembered being given pocket money and being allowed to walk to the store. Other people remember Halloween and the fun of running around the neighborhood uh, collecting candy. Other people remember it as a special treat given to them by their parents or maybe a special family member who'd come to visit and bring them a surprise. It was really a fun, open question and it elicited a lot of conversation. Um, other examples, what are some other uses for Smarties other than just eating? And we were talking about how Smarties could be used as a game for small children to learn math or um, as, a, as a bribe. And the, the sound of Smarties shaking in a box it immediately elicits a, people's attention. It has a very particular rattling sound. Why would you choose this box of candy over a different product? Another great open question where you can you can uh, almost inspire some debate. Who do you think is interested in this product? Uh, thinking about some demographic classifications. Or how do you feel about the packaging? We had an extended conversation about the impact of, pack, uh, of plastic packaging and how if you were to go down that line of questioning, you could ask about um, people's opinion about compostable packaging or you could... Uh, turn it into a second quantitative research where you look at intent to purchase and find out what are the price brackets 
for which people might be willing to pay for this product. If you're going to compostable packaging, there might be a slight price increase on this product. So open questions again, they're going to elicit additional conversation, not just a yes or no response. And in focus groups, well-structured open questions are going to help help uh, build a story for that product, such that you've got feelings and motivations and behaviors and beliefs coming back as your responses. Now, another thing that you want to do is be really careful about structuring the sentence to have the right meaning. And in English... Sentences have a subject, object, and verb, and that verb sets the tone. And the, the tone of the sentence is going to be really indicative of how people respond to that question. So let's jump ahead and, and figure out what these, what these verb um, moods are, as we, as we call them. Now, first off is indicative. And the indicative mood for a verb phrase would be something where you're just telling the facts. So in, in the case of when we talked about this in class, we talked about the indicative, we are discussing candy today. It's very factual. That's what we did. We discussed candy. Then we talked about the imperative, eat the candy. I am telling you what to do, and I can do it in a very calm and uh, to the point manner, eat the candy and describe your experience, that imperative is telling you what to do. And so being very deliberate, when you need people to act, you are going to put the sentence into the imperative tone. And in this case, it's not impolite, it's not bossy, but I want the people to eat the candy and describe their experience. Then there is the interrogative tone, and that is where you are using the phrase or sentence to ask a question. How do you feel about the candy? But then there are two other types of questions. And one is what would be considered the conditional. And that is where you're thinking about some possible scenarios, but they may or may not have happened. So for example, if the candy was coffee flavored, how would you feel? It's an open question, but we are putting it into a hypothetical situation that is quite feasible. As you noted, there were coffee crisps in the, um, in the Halloween candy box that we were uh, investigating. And a few people said, I do not like coffee. If we were to develop a new product and have it coffee flavored, that person would not be part of the demographic that would enjoy that product. Then there is also the subjunctive mood. And that is where you're talking about things that are imaginary and in some, in, in some scenarios, almost impossible. I realize that we could have zero calorie candy, but I, I phrased the, the question, what if candy had no calories? And honestly, the subjunctive, the aspect of moving questions into the imaginary space can be sometimes used effectively. It can be used often for when you're doing ideation, because you're encouraging people to go into the imaginary space. And it can be used for blue ocean mapping. If you are trying to think about new opportunities that are, uh, you're using almost a provocative statement to encourage people to think outside of the normal scenario. But subjunctive phrases, when used too heavily or without too much context, can get a bit annoying. <laughs> um, and so people need to have the right context. If they're, if they're going into an ideation session or they're going into a blue ocean mapping session, if you haven't watched those videos, do take the time to look up our ideation and blue ocean mapping um, discussions. If you spend all the time in the imaginary space, it doesn't give people a sense of grounding with what they're supposed to be working on. So each of these styles of phrases or sentences can be used very strategically when building out a script or building out a, a survey tool for doing qualitative research. Now, something else that's worth noting is the active versus passive voice. Now, there is a very uh, grammatical definition. Does the subject act on the object or does the object act on the subject? But from this perspective, I'm also just thinking about the tone of language. And so all of these 
phrases here more or less intend the same action. But you can see how, starting at the top, it's a very clear, um, it's a very clear uh, phrase that we have, and we want uh, it's oh, what is it in? The, oh, why am I? It's in the imperative tone. Pardon me. I'm having a, a Wednesday evening moment here. It's getting late. It's in the imperative tone. I am telling you, eat the candy, and I can say it very nicely eat the candy. But then I'm becoming more passive and more permissive in my language as I go down this line. Please eat the candy. It's, it's, it's polite, but it's still in the imperative tone. Would you please eat the candy? Now I'm starting to get into the conditional where I don't have to. Would you please eat the candy? No. Could you eat the candy? Maybe. <laughs> and then it gets even weaker. Can I ask you to please eat the candy? And suddenly the, the assertiveness of the voice has declined considerably. And something that I notice working with a lot of young professionals is that they often drop into this passive voice when asking people to do something. And when you are in charge of a focus group and facilitating, you want to be polite, you want to be at the same time assertive. And so focusing your language more towards the top end in the active voice and with a very, a very clear but polite imperative tone as compared to layering an imperative statement with all of these different conditional aspects. Can I ask you to please eat the candy becomes a very weak, um, it becomes a very weak statement versus eat the candy or please eat the candy. Please, I, I, I like please eat the candy. It's, it's polite. It is, it gives people a sense of um, respect, but at the same time, it's very clear. Oh, and then here's one more uh, idea. And, and that when you are in the process of facilitating a focus group or running a questionnaire, you need to be careful that you are not introducing biases when asking people questions. And so you are not somehow imposing your own values and beliefs or um, understanding of that product when asking them to do something. So let's say, for example, you are um, eliciting some initial responses about a candy product. Maybe you're working at Nestle and you're inventing the fifth chocolate bar to go in that box. If you were having a focus group of some of your concepts, you would say, eat the candy, please, versus enjoy the candy. We're asking people to consume the candy. And in the English language, enjoy the candy implies that you're going to eat it. But enjoy also implies that you are happy and enjoying it and um, experiencing positive a positive sensory experience when you are consuming that candy. And we can't, uh, when we're making these statements, we have to be very deliberate to not overimpose our own values or beliefs about that product. So you have to be very neutral in the verbs that you are selecting. Last but not least, I think this, uh, I think this is the last topic, which is where we're talking about probing. And so if you are in the process of facilitating a conversation, you often want to open up that conversation for additional commentary from the people participating. One of the most frequently used techniques is silence. And a good facilitator in a focus group conversation is going to give the space in their discussion so that at certain times they will just stop and pause and let the other people respond. And that space of silence to listen is important. In, in other cases, there will be um, certain phrases or techniques that are used in the conversation, and that can elicit more conversation. The best one is why. Now, why, when used too often, can be a bit annoying, but why opens up the conversation for people to explain themselves and justify their statement. Ways of uh, saying why with a little, a little bit uh, kinder and gentler tone 
would be, explain what you mean or describe that for me. When someone says something interesting that you want to probe and expand on further, you can use some of these statements to encourage the conversation and have it carry on a bit more and just dig a little bit deeper into that scenario. So these are some, some phrases that you almost want to have on a cue card when facilitating a conversation. You can't use probing so much in a in an online survey. You, well, you can. You can, you can phrase it so uh, the second question after a short answer box type format or a short paragraph type format could be explain what you mean. But perhaps in that first box, they explained it extremely well. It could be a little bit... Um, convoluted or confusing to an, uh, someone to answer if they've got probing type questions. Now, if you're really clever at computer programming, let's say you have a short answer question and someone just writes no or a one or two word answer, then if you were clever, you could have a word count and say, if the word count is less than five and have an if statement within, within the phrasing, then apply an additional probing question. Just explain what you mean. But that's additional computer programming, and we will leave it. <laughs> we'll leave it there. <laughs> um, those of you who are going to join sophisticated uh, sensory and consumer analytics companies, you can uh, give that as a concept. Anyways, I know the students who are in uh, the sensory analysis class are going to be trying hosting. I realize uh, it's unfortunate that we can't have samples this this semester, at least at this point, but uh, they're going to be hosting their first script for a focus group next week. And so I do want you to have some fun trying it out. And I had a fantastic conversation with one of the students this morning, and we were talking about the fact that sometimes people are terrified of trying something new and and, and that the fear of, of failing or not doing well stops them from doing anything. And Honestly, I can't stress this enough that you just got to go out there and try it and realize that right now you're uh, in a situation where there are people around you that really want to support you. I, I like to think that I'm a supporter of so many people out there. I, I'm, I feel like I'm the food science cheerleader for all of you guys. Honestly, just try it out. And um, the more you practice, the better you'll become. And the better you become, the more you'll be able to share this technique with more people. And... Um, keep on sharing the learning journey with others. So try it out. We will be having some fun with, in class and we'll see you all very soon. Take care.